Uh, w just told us about lots of challenges in productionized research in TCL. Uh, I think uh, today I want to talk about here is to a little bit about AI research at TCL uh, AI research. More specifically, since we have been preparing our third call for proposal, I want to talk about a little bit about research problems that is emerging from our production uh, and that are actually quite mission critical to our company. Uh, by the end of uh, my talk, I think you might have more questions than answers, but that's good uh, because that means we have more work to do and we hope to cover with every one of you if you are interested in our problems. So uh, the talk is uh, separated into two parts. One is, of course, I want to talk a little bit about our vision and uh, the, some of the mission critical directions that we have at TCL. And also I want to talk about a few research problems emerge from our applications. So first of all, our missions, our visions and mission critical depth directions. I think Dr. You already mentioned some of that. Uh, so if you look at the whole structure of the TCL, uh, we have two main sectors. One is TCL technologies, which is focused on semiconductor display, semiconductor photovoltaics, uh, finance and others. The other one, uh, TCL industries, uh, which is more focused on the um, the consumer, the consumer uh, electronics and other related emerging business sectors. Now with all these different companies focusing on different uh, directions and the uh, business sectors, TCL's vision is actually to become a leading technology company that can bring innovation product, innovative product and uh, service uh, to our customers and the consumers. Now, with that being said, as we are talking about AI today, uh, which of these directions can AI bring value to our business? So right now we see, as uh, me personally, uh, there are three mission critical directions where AI can fundamentally change our business. First of all, is smart life. Uh, so we've talked about smart lives and uh, uh, in lots of consumer electronics companies uh, or smart home. So right now, uh, if you think about smart home, what do people usually do is you take up their cellular cell phone or you uh, ask Alexa and say, okay, I want to, to tune the temperature to some certain degrees and you want uh, the curtain to be put out. Uh, so it, the, the, the users or the customs we have is still put on the driving wheel, behind the driving wheel to uh, take control of those IoT systems. But that's not, it's not actually quite smart. So what we uh, envision to have is to have a, some kind of smart brain that can replace the user's position in the entire circle and then captures the environment status as well as the user's intentions I think we, that's the key to the smartness of life. So that's one part we will talk about that today. And besides that, we also want to create a few new AI experience with all those new AI technologies, for example, AI assistant, uh, speech, NLP, computer vision, AR, VR, et cetera. Uh, some of the experience that we saw that were impossible in the, in the past and are now achievable. We will talk about that today. Um, also, as a semiconductor business, uh, that, which accounts for more than half our revenues, another thing that's always been on our mind is we want to produce the next generation of display material. We'll talk a little bit about, about that today. And the third direction is smart manufacturing, uh, as it could be eliminate uh, workplace efficiencies and cut lots of costs. Uh, so on the right, uh, so we will see, we just a small subset of AI technologies that we have touched upon uh, while developing solution to our problems uh, that we met on the left. Uh, the list will goes on and on and just uh, there's a few of them. Um, but um, with that for, without further ado, I want to you know move on to the next part, which is I want to talk about a few research problems emerge from the applications. Uh, so there are four main directions I want to talk about. Uh, one is, perceive, reason, and react. This is mainly for the smart home environment that we've talked about. And then the second is towards efficient ML revolution or on device AI, if you are in this area. And then so one is towards the next generation of the automatic industrial vision inspection. This is a small sub problems that we met in the smart factoring uh, area. And the four is AI for material uh, discovery. So, uh, these are the few directions I, I, I select to talk about today, and uh, I'll tell you exactly the problem we have been thinking about. We'd like to pick your brain, and uh, we want to brainstorm with you how we can solve, or maybe how we cannot solve some business problems. So, okay, here we go. 
the first one is perceive, reason, and react. Uh, as I just uh, talked about, uh, this, if you search for smartphone in Google uh, pictures, uh, Google images, uh, here I show a dozen of the images. And uh, uh, I think more, more than half of them has either a finger or a cell phone on this image. Uh, showing, indicating that actually people, uh, users are still the driving world, are still the driving factors uh, taking control of the smart home. So it's not quite smart. Uh, it's uh, not something that we want to see in the future. What we really want to see in the future is, you know, some kind of a smart brain uh, that can uh, actually, you know, replace the human beings in this position and can perceive reason and react to users' uh, uh, needs. So the first one we want to talk about is perceive and reason. So the, the thing that we want to do is we want to have a better understanding of the work. Uh, so there are two parts of information that we're particularly interested in. One is structural information. Uh, so lots of the word information can be organized by different objects uh, interacting with each other. For example, uh, here I show there's a social graph, we have the scene graphs, we have the knowledge graphs over here. Uh, there's a content interaction graphs, et cetera. So, uh, and also on the right, uh, it's got, actually got broke a little bit, but uh, we can see uh, here, I also show that, um, that people can interact with the actual the physical world. For example, Adam visits on a personal park, Alex is a friend of Timothy, things like that. So you have all those different informations in the physical world that can be organized in this, uh, in this graph. So the, the, the very first question we ask ourselves is, can we embed the world? Uh, in other words, is can we get a test agnostic representations or features uh, as uh, AI uh, researchers are familiar with, or as many entities as possible in the physical world based on the structural information that we listen here. And uh, these features should be useful for lots of downstream tasks and uh, nearest neighbors, for example, are semantically meaningful. Can we do that? Of course we can. Um, so this is actually the, what graph embedding trying to do. So. Graph embedding is trying to chain embeddings with objective that the connected nodes uh, have more similar embeddings than those unconnected nodes. So here we, we highlight a similar because we have to define this similarity function. So similarity function is actually specify how relationships in the vector space uh, map to the relationship in the original graph. So are these nodes similar if they are connected, if they share the same neighborhood, are there different, uh, are there different relationships and entity types? How, how about, how, how can we incorporate that into the similarity functions? Uh, that part has been done. Uh, there are lots of work in the literature that has already uh, solved that problem. So it looks like we can, we can embed the work, except that there are still a few big ifs we want to answer. Uh, first of all, do we have an approach to chain on a large scale heterogeneous graph? So that part is sort of soft. Uh, if you're interested, you can check this paper, a uh, PyTorch big graph that allows you to do large scale graph embedding. Now, the second big if we know, we want to know is, because uh, I just show, demonstrate there are so many different type, types of graph. Can we combine all these different sources or different types of graph uh, when we trying to build this gigantic graph embedding system? Well, that's actually not so clear because We've been finding that merging different graphs into a big graph is not very easy because first of all, you need to measure the authenticity of the graph. We need to make sure that there's, uh, you know, there's no uh, misinformation in this graph. That's first thing. Well, even though the graph, the information are correct, there are still big problems of deduplicating. Uh, the, like we find that deduplication is not very trivial uh, since the names of those nodes can be, can have lots of variations and the naive string comparison is not enough if you want to you know, completely deduplicate the graph. Now, that's one thing. A second thing, even if we can merge all those uh, different graphs into one big graph, the training graph embedding for a merge graph is not straightforward because some, for some part of the graph, you have nodes with very high degrees. And for some part of the nodes, you have, uh, you have uh, for some part of the graph, you have nodes with very small degrees, very, quite, very sparse. Some of the graph can be very dense. By merging these two together, like should we put different weights for different nodes and different uh, data set? And that's uh, actually a big question mark here. So we don't know how to do that. Now, the next thing we want to know, it, it, the next big if we have is, uh, we don't know how to incorporate useful site informations of nodes. For example, like we just talked about, we have this structure information, but 
we basically treat all those nodes as some unknown nodes. But what if we have some side information about those nodes? For example, like uh, we know uh, this this person interact with some certain graph, but we have the embedding for this graph. How can we take advantage of those information embedded in this graph information? That would be very interesting, and that can help you know uh, help us to understand the world more. Uh, so. It, so either way, we lack some systematic approach to combine those structural information and semantic information together, which bring us to our next topic. Uh, we want to perceive and reason with semantic information. Now, one of the biggest topics in AI for the last three years are large scale model pre-training. Uh, from 2018 to 2020, we have a uh, large scale pre-training NLP model from uh, 117 million parameters to 175 billion parameters. Uh, uh, you can see how crazy that is. And also we have seen folks starting to mix things together. For example, they can combine different type of uh, data modalities together. Uh, here you can see people start to do combine images and text uh, and they're trying to have, uh, 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 to take a step further to, to understand the world better. So our vision is that, well, we want to actually move a step further. How about uh, not only just trying to understand the text and images, we want to learn from every video without annotation. Well, we are not the first uh, ones that have this vision. In fact, there are lots of groups in academia and industry share the same direction uh, and vision. So there are largely three different types of methodology to solve this problem. Uh, one is uh, you can either define some pre-tested task, uh, either you can predict the speed of the video, you can I put an entire video and uh, separate into three different small chunks and you, you, you shuffle them and you want to learn a neural network to predict the temporal order of these three different uh, video clips. And uh, some people, uh, I think this is, uh, this is actually coming from uh, our, uh, Hong Kong University, a group, uh, by borrowing some ideas from a 2D jigsaw puzzles and uh, because the video is actually have a spatial and temporal, so we can do a 3D jigsaw puzzles and try to rearrange it so that we can, uh, you know, recover the original orders and recover original, you know, uh, jigsaw puzzles. So this is one way to predict, to define some pretest tasks and then let the algorithm to figure out how to solve this pretest task. Uh, pre task. And the second part is constructive learning, which has been very popular in image. Uh, uh, so the fundamental algorithm is try to, you know, prepare some positive and negative sample pairs for constructive learning. You want to pull away for those negative, uh, you know, you're sorry, you want to pull together those positive samples and you want to push away those negative sample pairs. Uh, if you're interested, there's a paper, I think just, uh, uh, I think released uh, two weeks ago uh, by Facebook. They're trying to do a systematic study on a large scale study on unsupervised spatial temporal representation learning. But uh, we found uh, not only in video representation learning, but also for image SSL, is that contrastive approach perform very differently on different downstream tasks. So there's no uniform, uh, universal uh, uh, sort of a criteria and say, okay, this contrastive learning approach is better than the others, because we find that on different downstream tasks, these uh, representation learning learned uh, with different approaches can behave differently uh, on different data sets. Now, the third uh, way to do that is cross modality, which is you can use other data modality for uh, to, to supervise video representation learning. For example, you can try to match the text and the speech uh, to, 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 to the video. Um, you can combine all those data, data modality together and try to see if you can learn a better representation learning. Now, one problem we realize that uh, video information is too rich and perhaps redundant. So we realize those low level information are actually quite important and efficient for understanding the video content. Uh, so for example, a group from MSRA, they, they try to do the same similar thing. They try to focus more on how local information change between the frames. They randomly crop one or multiple patches on the video clip and, and the scale the move in a smooth way and change the neural network to create predictive positions and the size of patches in each frame. But when they uh, present this work, uh, we realize on uh, the video compression algorithm doing something exactly the same. Uh, so if you're, you're familiar with the video compression, it's actually trying to do 
you know, it's actually trying to use a little information, as little uh, storage as possible to represent as much video information as possible. So there are lots of uh, intra-frame uh, predictions. There's lots of inter-frame predictions as well. So uh, are we trying to ask ourselves, what can we learn from this video compression algorithms? And there's anything we can incorporate into video SSL. And, uh, and also this is one thing too, uh, we realize a video a codec might be a way to do uh, self-supervised learning. And maybe the right input for our video understanding network should be the encoded representation of those uh, videos because you know that's a better way to represent a, a clip of videos. Of course, those two ideas need to be verified. Uh, once we have a better understanding of the word, the third thing we want to do is react. And so we want to you know, assist users and to interact with users. Here, I shamelessly borrowed a title from a Google AI blog saying, towards a conversational agent that can chat about anything. Uh, so essentially we have the same problem because internally at CCL, we have this AI assistant, uh, which right now is only to do those uh, functional commands. So for example, can you switch to a next song? Can you search for movies, things like that? Uh, we have been getting lots of feedback from the users uh, saying that, oh, this is great. We have this like recommending movies and all that, but is that possible? We can add a little bit of a chit chat on top of that. Uh, and uh, more importantly, can we make all those, uh, you know, chit chat more, transition more smoothly from the current functional commands? So if you're familiar with, uh, you know, those uh, conversational agents, uh, you know, those chit chat is actually referring to open domain chatbot. And uh, I, in literature, it's often divided into two different parts. If you want to do a chit chat, it's an open domain, uh, sort of a dialogue AI. If you want to do, you know, closed domain, it's a different problem. Uh, like it's to the best, of, to the best of my knowledge, there's there very little work to combine closed domain and open domain uh, chatbot together. So uh, not to say, not to, let alone that there's little work to do, you know, tra transition from open domain to closed domain and vice versa to make the entire dialogue more smooth and human-like. So that's one thing that we want to achieve. And another thing, because if we want to do open domain, there are lots of different criteria to, to, to tell you what is a, a good conversation. First of all, it, it, it's, the entire dialogue, dialogue need to be sensibleness, you know, your answer should try and, your, your answer should be sensible to the questions. And also it need to be uh, have very specific. For example, I don't know could be the answer to any questions. It's sensible, but it's not very specific. We want your answers to be very specific. Uh, we want the uh, conversational AI to be knowledgeable man, to, to be knowledgeable. Uh, we want uh, there will be there will be a way to personalize this uh, conversational agent. Uh, we need to have the sympathy. Uh, we also need to consider safety issues of this uh, conversational agent. And the last but not least, we want this uh, conversational a uh, to agent to be you know quite fair. Uh, there's no bias towards uh, genders and race and uh, age groups, uh, for example. Uh, to move a step further, we want uh, the conversation agent to develop, develop even some personalities uh, and trying to learn what kind of uh, ways to talk to, to talk to people will be become the best buddies of those users. And we, we want this conversational agent to be a very important part of uh, human life. So that's actually the, the next version of, the, the, I think, the React part of our uh, smartphone uh, problem. So with that being said, uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, this um, smart home environment and uh, which one of very important thing is those smart home devices are actually end devices. Uh, so that's bring on to our next topic, which is efficient AI evolution. So the, er the area of on device machine learning or efficient machine learning seeks to take state of our algorithms that are originally conceived to run on data centers and find ways to make those techniques to run on mobile devices, overcoming severe, uh, severe constraints of compute, memory, and energy. Now, some of those technology already exist today. Uh, actually, there's one slide missing here, but anyway, it's okay. Uh, so I think there are ways, for example, there are embedded accelerators that can allow machine learning algorithms to run more efficiently. Uh, there are also very simple techniques, for example, no pruning, where you can access the model architectures very carefully and see which one of them can be removed. 
Uh, these all progress has been great, but is the same directions uh, going to allow us to move forward at the same rate of progress? Uh, this is questionable. Uh, I think we need to understand there is a growing gap between the on-device AI and, the algor and AI algorithms run on data centers. And all those breakthroughs in uh, machine learning in the past five years come at a great uh, cost of computation, uh, computation cost. So therefore, I think on-device AI is going to be, or has already been a very interesting area in machine learning and requires new breakthroughs. Now, when we think about what efficient ML device need to look like in 2030, uh, we have three different uh, visions. This is actually, this size is actually credited to Professor McLean from Cambridge University that we have been collaborating with. Uh, so first of all, right now, uh, lots of those on-device AI the machine learning tasks is only classification. We think the on-device and machine learning world goes far beyond just classification. We'll do dense predictions, we'll do you know, a reasoning and reinforcement learning, things like that. Uh, and lots of learning can, can happen in those on device, in those uh, end devices. And we find that, we, we think that a size of our accuracy will come from efficient ML models. The reason being with the development of self-supervised learning and there are so many end devices, the on device AI will have an unfair advantage over centralized uh, computer vision, oh, sorry, centralized AI models uh, over you know, seeing so many different seeing so many different um, examples. And uh, I, think, I think what we have is own device AI will replace centralized computation center as a heart of AI. Now, one direct direction that we, we've been particularly interested in is a software hardware co-optimization. So traditionally what people do is they design some neural networks uh, that does well on some problems and they fit into hardware and there are lots of hardware uh, operations and you can optimize. But oftentimes we find that these two parts are not independent to each other. If we can combine these two together and uh, uh, we can do some co-design of deep neural network and hardware operations, that'll be more efficient and also of course can be optimized better. So we're trying to find a way if we can design some kind of design course that can take considerations of the deep neural network architectures and also act, uh, hardware operations and uh, try to do software, so-called hardware software co-optimization. Um, as are shown by lots of research work, this is possible. And as a first baby step, what we have been doing is we're trying to uh, figure out an approach to use NAS to find a model or find a set of architectures for dense prediction tasks that can quantize well on specified hardware. So there are lots of research questions here. One being, how do we define such search, search base uh, for NAS algorithms? And how do we transfer between different uh, dense screen prediction tasks using this type of approach? Uh, another direction uh, in on device AI is sharing and cooperation while protecting those privacy. Of course, uh, this has been a very, you know, a topic. Uh, people are trying to do understand though, you know, the differential privacy uh, issues about uh, different AI algorithms. Uh, people are trying to see if we can develop some, some algorithms that, that can, can share and cooperate on different, on different end devices. So uh, for example, there, this is essentially the, the but the, we want to understand, like if we want to do federal level learning on, on, on uh, heterogeneous devices, if the data are IID across different end devices, um, and uh, what will be the performance gap of different algorithms after those algorithms being federated? So that would be a very interesting question. Uh, so we've been collaborating with uh, uh, several research groups. And uh, I think there's one framework that can do some of that. Uh, this is called FLOWER. Uh, and we have been actively uh, contributing to that open, open source framework uh, to trying to see if we can uh, make this federated learning work on those different constraints. Okay, the third topic, uh, towards next generation of the automatic industrial vision inspection. Uh, so uh, as you guys might already familiar with from the, the Dr. Yu's uh, talk, so this part of the work is trying to detect and segment possible effective areas of a product image and subsequently classify them into defect categories. But 
you might ask why is this just a very simple computer vision classification task or segmentation task? There are lots of like algorithms out there that can be used to do this. We found that there's still actually uh, uh, some problems that's very specific to our use cases. For example, we find uh, our images, our examples are uh, they're very large uh, within class variation, unlike you know the natural image you have seen. There is subtle defect appearances. Uh, the first one might be very easy to tell, but the second and third, you can actually very difficult to tell uh, the, the, the defect. Um, so there's a little bit of a color change between the, you know, the, the, the correct ones and the defect ones. Uh, there are different lightings and different backgrounds and uh, for those images, um, unlike those natural images. And uh, of course, uh, there are some problems shared with uh, natural image tasks. For example, we have intensive annotation costs, we have model generation challenges and many more. So the way how we do that is we want to uh, separate this problem into two parts. One is we want to, we want to solve the fat head problems, which is you know, the problems that we can, that are easy to solve, but we want to solve it with less labors and less you know, annotation as possible. Uh, so basically we want to learn models that can generalize that. So, We'll talk about that. But essentially, the goal is we want to have a supervised fe feature representation pre-trained model that can, you know, learn what are the features that can be quite important for this task, and therefore we can use very little uh, label data uh, to get the performance that we need. And there's another problem, a long tail problem, because you know this kind of problem has very long tail. So we try to solve it by a different kind of techniques, few shot learning or zero shot learning, anomaly analysis, et cetera. Um, because we think like there's no silver boy to solve all the problems all together. Uh, we separate into these two. Um, so when we talk about trying to do, you know, feature representation learning, you might also start to think, well, there are lots of self-supervised learning approaches out there, why don't you use that? So uh, the reason being, we find there are lots of differences between natural images and industrial uh, inspection images. For example, we find that the pre-trained natural image features do not necessarily transfer better on industrial inspection vision tasks. We found that self-supervised uh, natural image features, uh, sorry, self-supervised learned natural, uh, natural image features do not necessarily transfer better on industrial inspection vision tasks. For example, here, we uh, take a few representation learnings learned by different uh, self supervised approach, uh, contrast learning approach, in fact. Uh, on the y x axis are their performance on ImageNet. On the y axis are their performance on an open source industrial vision inspection task called um, MV Tech. You can see that uh, besides, uh, sorry, uh, despite uh, uh, the fact that there are some chains. For example, jigsaw puzzles and the road net are, you know, uh, consistently low across these two tasks. But for other two, other four approaches, they are not, you know, correlated. Um, you know, Moco V2 has very high accuracy. Um, uh, uh, for example, on uh, MV Tech, but it has actually quite low accuracy on the image net. So this is, shows that these uh, approaches cannot be learnings from natural images cannot be necessarily applied to our uh, our scenario. So there are lots of conjectures that need to be verified. Uh, so that's lots of research question lies in, in that area. So we also find that domain adaptations are very difficult. I mean, feature learned on images from one production line cannot be easily transferred to a different production line. And uh, we also want to do uh, do you know detection and segmentation. We find that sub supervised learned uh, feature representation. Uh, beyond classification is also very difficult problems. Of course, that's actually the, the problem shared across different uh, shared, uh, that, that we encounter in natural image uh, vision tax as well. Uh, so last, we want to talk about the next generation of material discovery. So more specifically, since we are studying the quantum dot display material, which is a nano crystal with a core shell structure optimized for high luminance efficiency and uh, stability. So there are lots of things uh, involved in this material synthesis process. There are different choices of materials for the core and shells that allows for the confinement of an action and the whole wave functions, which in turn determines the, the optical and electronic uh, properties. Uh, let's say our fun, final target is trying to maximize uh, the photoluminous quantum efficiency or PLQE in shot. 
we want to consider other constraints, for example, the peak weightless, which determines the color of the display, and the four ways at the half maximum that indicates the purity of the color, for etc. There are lots of different uh, parameters that can control this experiment. For example, the amount and the types of precursor, the temperatures, the time allowed for chemical reactions, uh, so many different things. But it takes a very long time to do those experiments. So there we have very little data. So if even we want to do it in a machine learning way, uh, we want to you know sort of map. The, we want to get the statics, uh, statistics, uh, you know, statistical uh, uh, correlations between those input attributes and output targets. We still need lots of data. So luckily, what we have is we have a microfluidic platform that combined with in situ photoluminance monitoring for material synthesis experiments. So essentially, you can treat this as a black box, and there are lots of different knobs you can tune to uh, to control this uh, synthesis experiment. And there's an output from this black box that can tell you the result. Um, so if you can if you can think about this as a recommendation system, for example, there are different lots of different ways to tune the hyperparameters with algorithms. And your target is let's say you want to improve the CTR or uh, some other metric for this recommendation system, is this is exactly the same type of problems. Um, there are lots of different ways in academia that can solve these problems. And we're trying to see if there is a way to can borrow those ideas and then can be applied to this next generation of material discovery. Okay, so there are many more problems that we haven't got a chance to talk about today. And uh, uh, I hope these questions, uh, uh, research questions uh, can make you feel, feel very excited and interested. We're very open to research collaborations and we aim to advance the state of art uh, through open research. We've been collaborating with lots of uh, our uh, uh, Frontier AI uh, Research Institute and different AI labs. And uh, come talk to us if you are interested in our problems and we are looking forward to working with every one of you. Uh, thank you so much. Um,